Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Outgrow's Marketer of the Month and Technologist of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Saksham Sharda. I'm the creative director at Outgrow.co. And for this month, we're going to interview Az Alon, who is a co-founder and CEO at HoneyBook. Thanks for joining us, Az. Thank you for hosting. So Az, we're going to start with a rapid fire round just to break the ice. You get three passes. In case you don't want to answer the question, you can just say pass but try to keep your answers to one word or one sentence only, okay? Yeah, do, I'll try my best. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Well, so the first one is, at what age do you want to retire? Sorry. Never. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? Too long. Favorite color? Right now, pink. What time of day are you most inspired? Very early in the morning and very late at night. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? I need to sleep at least six hours. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened? The city of Tel Aviv. Pick one, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. Ah, uh, um, well, Elon is crazy, but look what, like, come on, like the impact in the world he's done. How do you relax? Take a deep breath. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? At least five. A habit of yours that you dislike? No, actually, uh, um, not being patient. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? To love people. Is it a skill? Fair. And clear. The next one is your favorite Netflix show. Oh, I don't. Well, I was, um, the last dance was on Netflix. Uh, I'm not sure, but perhaps it was, yes. Uh, the next one is the last song you've been listening to that had a good impression on you. Always imagined. The first and last. Okay. All right, well, that's the end of the rapid fire round. Now we can use code quite well. And now we can move on to the longer questions, uh, which you can answer with as much ease and time as you like. The first one is, could you share the journey of HoneyBook from its founding in 2013 to securing a significant Series E funding round valued at $2.4 billion? Um, yeah, so it's interesting, you know, uh, <clears throat> we tend to believe that companies have like this co-founding moment and, and then we can go back to kind of like, you know, this is what happened and why we started what we started and, and, from my experience, it didn't really work that way. There were so many co-founding moments that only in hindsight, I can go back in time and say, you know, that happened in 2013. Or maybe it was something we've done in 2011. Or maybe when we got married in 2009, we already stopped thinking about it. Um, and the truth is that it, all of it is true. It's all of the above, right? That, that was the beginning. Uh, back then, Naama, who's my wife and co-founder, um, whom we're, whom I'm, I'm dating since we were 16 and know her since we were 13. Um, but back then, uh, in, in, back in 2013, both of us were uh, small business owners. Naama owned this, a, a design studio and, and design websites, and, uh, and I owned a bar. And we were just amazed that, you know, while as service-based businesses that we were, um, we really cared about the, the service, the level of service. Uh, and we wanted to make it a great experience for our clients to work with us, right? Uh, but we were surprised that as consumers from other businesses, it wasn't always the case. For example, many businesses asked us to to pay them with checks or cash 
And, you know, we didn't, we, we prefer to pay with a credit card. And I think that was kind of the realization that there's no, no platform for service-based businesses to sell their services, to communicate in a modern way with their clients to accept online payments. Uh, and that was kind of that understanding together with um, a lot of work with potential customers that led us to do what we do today. The other thing that was interesting back then in 2013 was um, that while we thought about it when we were in Tel Aviv, uh, one of our very early investors offered us $25,000 uh, with the condition to move to Palo Alto. And, and you know, being in Tel Aviv, uh, I remember calling my wife and our co-founder, Dwar, and telling them that, you know, we just got this offer of $25,000. Uh, and they asked me, you know, so what, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the catch, right? And I said, well, the catch is that the guy said we need to move to Alto Palto. And, um, and you know, both of them, my, my wife and Dwar, my co our co-founder, uh, were start, they started searching Alto Palto on Google, trying to figure out where is that. Uh, obviously, the, I was referring to Palo Alto, of which I didn't know until that day. And, and a week later, we were already in Palo Alto. Now, all this is important, I think, for two reasons. One... Uh, is that when we got to Palo Alto, we sought meet we we met with other entrepreneurs and investors, and what's really interesting about that Silicon Valley mindset is one anyone will meet with you, it doesn't matter who they are, they're curious about what you're doing, and two, uh, you meet you meet with people that build huge companies, and they actually believe that you're going to build one as well. You know, while you don't, they do. Um, a very interesting phenomenon. So that's the first thing that happened to us in Palo Alto, and 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 uh, and then the second thing that I that I like to share about this story about Alto Palto is that the fact that you know it sounds funny to say Alto Palto today, but I probably say Alto Palto twenty times a day about different things, and I don't even know it, right? You know, kind of. Operating a company and a startup, uh, you every day you need to learn, like like a new skill, a new thing. Like the company grows and it requires different things from you, so you need to kind of uh, get used to the fact that you just you know nothing, right? And you just need to learn as fast as you can. So these two things, uh, you know, I, I like to take. Uh, these are the takeaways from that Alto Palto story and moving to Palo Alto. When we got to Palo Alto, one of the people we met um, is, is, is Bobby, whom then invested in our first round, invested a million dollars in the first round, and invested uh, many times since. But what was interesting, again, was that Bobby, uh, he was the founder of Ariba Network. So he built like a multi-billion dollar company, went public, then ended up being acquired by SAP. But from his eyes, kind of looking at us and seeing how he's imagining a company as big as Ariba, uh, it really got us to start believing in, wow, this could be, this could be a big thing, right? Um, and then we started meeting customers. And I can't stress enough how important it is for a company to just go to market as soon as possible and talk to people. Um, you know, one, one interesting thing that happened to us back then, I don't know, I'm going too long maybe, so just feel free to stop me. I'm, I'm still in 2013 and there's another 10 years to go. So, so that was back in 2013. Uh, over the years, we were able to attract customers and, you know, business model at HoneyBook. Uh, so first of all, what is HoneyBook? We, we make it easy to run a service-based business. And service-based businesses of the likes of business coaches, photographers, interior designers, web designers, they use HoneyBook to communicate with their clients and accept online payments. So our business model is really that, like a transaction fee on the online payments and a subscription fee on, on using our, our software. Um, so back in 2014, 
uh, we transacted in the entire year a million dollars um, of uh, you know a member's uh, business. Uh, and what was interesting is to see how over the years the business grew to a point that today you know we we, we transacted that amount in the, like probably in the past two hours. So when we think about a company how this journey from like the first year you, you do you know the amount that ten years later you do in two hours, you're making two hours. Uh, the other thing I would say is over the year we saw more and more kind of different verticals. Or different professions join us. Um, we grew our team in San Francisco. We grew our team in Tel Aviv. Um, my wife and I lived in San Francisco for eight and a half years until we moved back uh, to Tel Aviv to operate from here. Uh, we still have a team on both sides. 50% of the companies they're sent he here. Uh, and then another few facts is over the years, we were lucky to attract great investors um and as we were we got the business you know we grew over a hundred million dollars of revenue annually uh we serving more than a hundred thousand uh of these service-based businesses we're able at the same time to raise uh five more than 500 million dollars uh to support this this growth and the the future of that growth so we're very excited about the possibility and so how has this Series E funding round impacted the company's future plans and strategies? Well, I, I'll say this, and I think the Series E uh, really ensured that that we can keep building um, and creating value with a lot of confidence for our community. Uh, the businesses that use HoneyBook rely on us to manage all of their clients and more and more are assigned to rely on us on managing all of their cash. And we take that very seriously. Uh, so with the latest funding in the Series E, it, it helped us really invest uh, in these areas. Uh, at the same time, I will say, you know, HoneyBook is not the kind of company that kind of raised money and tripled the team uh, we're a relatively small team. When you think about our revenues, we are we're a team of 230 employees. Uh, so, you know, I think we really wanted to, even after we raised a uh, significant amount, uh, we want to keep on operating the company with discipline and staying as lean as we can. Uh, another reason this is really important for us is the, our target audience. We serve small businesses, you know, micro businesses even many times. And and it's important for us to stay as lean and small as we can so we can stay as close as we can to them to be able to meet with them, uh, listen to them, and, and, you know, kind of not get too, too distance from that mindset that they have running their businesses. So how do you envision this concept of client flow and its significance for these independent small businesses? Like what specific challenges does HoneyBook help these businesses address by optimizing their client flow? So the concept of client flow is something that we had to come up with over the years because it was very hard to explain that combination. Is it a CRM? Is it a payment platform? Uh, and what we realized over the years is that uh, service-based businesses um, don't use an online store to sell their services, right? They, they don't sell goods, they sell services. So they that, that selling process, that commerce, happens in a different way. And it happens through communication, through sending a proposal, an agreement, an invoice, and accepting a payment. So we had to give that a name, and we called it a client flow. So a client flow is a parallel of a online store for an e-commerce business, right? And the pain that, that it solves is that these businesses, especially these personalized service-based businesses, really rely on the ability to, on the one hand, they want to close a deal, right? They have a new potential client. They want to close that deal. But on the other hand, they want to make sure uh, they set the right expectations. 
they want to make sure that even they vetted that client. They don't want to work with anyone, right? They want to make sure it's the right client for them. So in the client flow, like there's this kind of um, balance between wanting to close the deal, but wanting to spend the time setting the expectation and starting that relationship in the best possible way. And that tension between these two is what we work on like every day for probably the past 10 years. So you've also mentioned in your earlier speeches that you uh, you mentioned doing things that didn't scale, such as manually handling customer support and wiring payments to members individually. How did these hands-on efforts help you better understand your members and their businesses? And how did they contribute to your ability to anticipate and address their needs? Um, I love that question, actually. I think, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, you're right. We did. Uh, tr- I personally transacted manually uh, 1,743 transactions, um, and you know what, what? When I look back at that, I think it's important for any company to figure out what are the things you know you can automate, right? Um, and what are the things you need to prove. We knew that we need to prove that we can solve that pain, that we can create real value. And we didn't spend the time automating the back end until we can prove that, right? So we said, okay, I can just go into the bank account and I get our company's bank account and transfer the money. Every time someone accepts an online payment, I will transfer the money um, to that, to our customer, right? Um, And it got to a point that I just couldn't, you know, I, I was afraid to go to sleep because I want to be, make sure I transact the money on time. I don't miss the cutoff. Um, because if I do, it will go over the weekend. It won't get their money on time. Uh, so it was a, it was a, it was a big pain. You know, I will get the notifications on my phone in the middle of a meeting. I will see a notification. It's a, it's getting close to the cutoff. I will run out and try to transfer the money as, as fast as I can. But in hindsight, what that, that what that did to me, like as and and now I benefit as a CEO, is I got to see and feel every single transaction. I knew who is the customer, who is the member that received the transaction, who is the member that didn't receive a transaction for quite a while. There was a name I didn't see for quite a while, and I would I would say to the team, you know, did anyone notice what happened with her? You know. I didn't see that name and the team will check and we will call her. And many times we would find that, you know, that member was frustrated about something. And the fact that I could feel and see it helped us mitigate that or, or, or understand we're doing something wrong. Um, that we're not serving our member in the best possible way. So it really helped me as a CEO be as connected as possible to the core of our business. And, and that's something I, you know, I, I would share and advise any entrepreneur out there, like try to tie yourself into like the core of the business. And I'm not saying you need to do everything manually or, or, or build things that they don't scale, but you'll benefit from that and the company will benefit from that. So as this need for a strong client flow and innovative solutions continues to grow, how does Honeybook plan to deliver differentiated value and stay ahead in, ahead in the market? So we believe that the combination of you managing your clients and your cash in one place creates magic because it's 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 money with context, right? We can share with you, we can give you a view of everything that is going on in your business and the most accurate view. And at the same time, you know, help you make decisions with confidence. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, kind of there's four C's as a as a as a service based business that you have. You have your clients, your cash, your calendar that's time, and your craft. Uh, we want to be differentiated by the fact that the first three C's will be managed on HoneyBook. 
the fourth one is yours. The craft is yours. That's your superpower. Uh, I hope it answers. No, for sure. And how and what role do you think brand plays here? How do you envision the relationship between brand strength and customer trust going forward? Brand, you know, when we think about brand at Honeybook, we always start with our with our core values. Honeybook's core values, the company's core values, uh, because I, we do believe that real brands start there with your employees, right? With our, our team members at Honeybook, how they experience, like who they are, how they experienced, you know, building Honeybook, and and what are these values that that guide us? And so it starts there. Then it's about the fact that we are absolutely obsessed about our members, and not only we're we obsessed about our members. But we are all obsessed about love. It sounds, I don't know, corny maybe, or, but we are all people that care about the fact that our members love us. And every time that that's not the case, if there's like a bad review, it, you know, it really hurts. Uh, we we we're bothered by, bothered by it. And it doesn't paralyze us. It really kind of motivates us to fix it and do whatever needs to be done. Uh, but at the same time, just to see how how every single employee in this company takes it to heart when they see a bad review or vice versa or the opposite. When we see a good review, you know, it just kind of it just fills up with us with energy. I believe that is like what is building the brand of this company. That's the brand. That's what every one of our members experiences when they when they work with Honeybook. And if they don't experience that, we're doing something wrong. And and if that's the case, we, we're gonna work really hard to fix that. So leaving all this aside, the last question for you is of a personal kind. What would you be doing in your life if not this right now? Um, you know, in Israel, the first language is Hebrew. Uh, I would love. So, one of the things I'm I'm keen about is is that every I think like every kid in Israel should be bilingual, and um and and be fluent in English, because I think it's the best way to kind of the, to um to increase the opportunity that that every single person will have. And then outside of Israel, if we if I can do that on a global, you know, in the world, I would love to spend every single minute that I have working on that. Um, so more people have a common language. Well, hopefully I get to interview you from that aspect someday on this podcast as well. Uh, well, that was the last question. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this month's episode of Outcrow's Marketer of the Month. That was Oz Alon, co-founder and CEO at Honeybook. Thanks for joining us, Oz. Thank you. Check out their website for more details and we'll see you once again next month with another Marketer of the Month.